All right. So we are going to jump into our teaching today, and we're in the, in the Redeeming Christmas series. And um, Erica, I stole your water, by the way. Erica's my wife. She's the middle vocalist there this week, and, and I stole it. So if you need water, it's there. All right. Um, Redeeming Christmas. Sorry, family moment at the Foundry. Um, Redeeming Christmas is our series, and we're taking the, the, the elements of our celebrations and our Christmases, and we're looking at it with a biblical lens. And what would God say about what we're doing, and, and what are some of the great uh, historical roots and traditions that we take part in, maybe unknowingly, and um, how does that get a gospel twist in our life? Today, we are going to um, talk about an invitation to a Christmas party. Um, celebrations. If I said to you today, what comes to mind when I say Christmas party? Please don't shout it back. But I know there's various images. For me, when I say Christmas party, what I think of is Clark W. Griswold, right? Yeah, I love the man. I, my wife doesn't like Clark Chevy Chase. It breaks my heart every time. But it, 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 she's not a Chevy fan, which a lot of people aren't, but they're broken and we pray for him. Um, <laughs> Chevy and Christmas vacation is beautiful. And just as like, we were at dinner with friends the other day and he, the husband and I started talking. I was like, we have to stop or we will literally do the whole Christmas vacation movie and our wives will hate us. And that wasn't acceptable. So we stopped, but it's so fun because I think of him, his sweater, his wild eyed excitement at the family Christmas. You get this image in your head of these gatherings right? It's so fun. For some of us, we have that, that fun extended family Christmas party. It's always a little bit janky because that relative shows up and it's weird, but we also have fun traditions there. We have the mysterious at the DeYoung family Christmas party, the mysterious shrimp ring. I don't know who brings it, but they're a shrimp cocktail every year. And I don't know why it's a holiday tradition. It's like the wreath of the sea, right? They have this little shrimp ring, and I'm like, why is that there every year? I, that, that's one of the things that stands out to me. We play games, we have fun. Maybe you have a work party. Anybody here have a work Christmas party? Well, that's always a delight, isn't it? You know, Bob gets hammered, and it gets a little weird. It's just the... <laughs> These, these Christmas parties, it's really bad when like Jerry decides to, he's had a little too much, he gets to the karaoke mic and sings from the police, I'll be watching you, to poor <laughs> Janet who didn't know he liked her and now Jerry needs a new job. It's just like, oh, work parties. Like you have these gatherings at Christmas time and you wonder what, why, why do we gather? Why is it so natural for us to gather at Christmas? And it's because God instituted it. God instituted celebrations and days of remembrance for his people. When the people of God gathered, Israel, before Christ came, they had these places where they, they were called by God to gather, and God would gather them to these events that they would remember his faithfulness, and they would be reminded of who God is and who they were called to be. It was a moment where God called people together to remember and to remember well. So, Forgive my poor movie choices, but um, have you ever seen the movie Tangled? Anybody? Yeah, it's a great movie. I loved it. I don't know why, but there's a scene with it that played through my head a number of times this week. As I looked at the text that I was going to teach, it didn't feel like Christmas. And every time I looked at the text and thought about Christmas, I thought of that moment in Tangled when Flynn Rider is sword fighting Maximus the horse who had a pot in his mouth. And Flynn Rider said, you should know this is the strangest thing I've ever done. Do you remember that scene? That's how I feel today. This feels strange because it's not not Christmassy, but it is right. It is right. And it may feel strange, but I'm going to ask you, stick with me for a minute. Stick with me as we step into this and see if indeed God's speaking. And if maybe, even though it's not Christmassy, it's pretty accurate. In the book of Isaiah, he's a prophet and he is speaking to the people of Israel. And he says these words to them in Isaiah 1. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me and I'm weary of bearing them. God, through the prophet Isaiah, said that to his people. And I think the reality of that is brutal. The reality of that scripture is brutal. That's not someone's opinion. God is talking to his people about the way they observe his commandments. Just listen if this sounds like God in our minds. Your new moon feast and your appointed festivals, 
I hate with all my being. That sounds more like someone stuck in traffic, right? That doesn't sound like God, does it? But it is. And he goes on to say, they have become a burden to me and I'm tired of carrying them. I'm tired of bearing them. So the question really becomes for us is what is the prophet Isaiah talking about through this? What is God trying to say through Isaiah so that they would hear? In the time before Christ, when Isaiah was a prophet and the kingdom of Israel was intact, God appointed festivals. And if you wonder what the festivals are, go look in Leviticus chapter 13, the oft unread book of Leviticus, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus chapter 23. And you'll find in chapter 23, the appointed festivals. And that's what God's talking about. God's talking about the places he called them to go and celebrate. And I think what, what it does is it reveals to us that God is speaking through Isaiah and saying that he desired relationship and faithful obedience. He desired a connection with them and those actions, the behaviors of an observance, of a, of a meal of remembrance, of a coming together to celebrate was to be reminded of God's faithfulness and their calling to respond. Rather than keeping, keeping people in relationship, the, the feasts that God is speaking out against here have become an obscenity in God's eyes. He can't stand them. He goes as far as to say, God says, I hate them. Why? Why does God hate them? Because I think when you're religious, when you get a little cold-blooded and you're all about the one, two, three systematic understanding of how you live for God, a good Christian life, you get this cold-blooded kind of behavior that's very moralistic. You do the right things and you are appearing to be the right thing, but nothing in here has changed. Nothing inside of us has changed. The religious activity becomes the Novocaine to an abscessed soul and it makes it feel numb but it sure isn't alive and it's not getting any better. Moral behavior doesn't make us better. And God hated that those feasts had become something that made them feel like everything was okay. What God wanted to do was let people know in that statement, he's not concerned with their obeying, he's concerned with their heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? So we recognize God's not concerned with his people not doing the right thing. God's, not, God's true concern is why aren't they the right thing? Why aren't they being the right thing? His concern for them was their heart. Even though they were observing all the things they were supposed to and following the letter of the law, they weren't being the people God called them to be. And God hated it. So when we recognize this, what we have to do is ask ourselves, what and why do we celebrate at Christmas? So what do we celebrate at Christmas and why do we celebrate at Christmas? Here's why we celebrate at Christmas, because God started the tradition. On the night that Christ was born, there were shepherds out in the field keeping their watch of flocks by night. I think there's a song written to that. And, um, and it was a joke, by the way. But anyways, you, you have these shepherds out there and all of a sudden the heavens open up and an angel descends and starts talking to these shepherds. It's a big moment in history. And he says, go to Bethlehem just up the road and go to this little stable, this little out barn. And in it, you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. It's my son. It's the son of God. Go and worship. There were angels. There were shepherds. There were men from the Orient, from the far east, uh, eastern regions of the known world, coming to bring gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Like gold for a carpenter, you don't normally get a bag of gold back then. Frankincense and myrrh were incredibly expensive and ironically or, or quite poignantly used to anoint the body of Christ once he had died. Right? So we recognize God celebrated the birth of Jesus Christ. The son, come, son of God coming down was a really, really big deal. And so what we celebrate is the birth of Christ. And why we celebrate is because God did it first and kind of it comes naturally, doesn't it? Do you ever think like I do, why do we wait and have like 47 parties in a three-week period and then not talk to people for a whole year? Anybody else? You're like, hey, you look the same but worse. Let's eat. 
you know? And, and you just do that, and you do that like 45 times. In a three-week period, you're done, you're bloated, you're all salt-laden, and you're like, oh, this is the worst. I can't have another cookie, but one more to see if it helps, you know? And you, you go through that ritual, and then for 11 months, we ignore people. And we don't, we don't have those connections. And what I think is important is it helps us understand what we celebrate is the birth of Christ, the Son of God come down to the world, not in the form of a conquering king, but the Son of God, Jesus Christ, coming down in the form of an infant baby, born to an unwed teenage mother, at whose breast he would find nourishment, at whose arms he would find safety when there was very little to be given of either. They were poor, their diet would have been meager, and they were not safe. But God sends his son into that volatile environment to be cared for and taken care of. There's something beautiful and worth celebrating in how Christ came. Because it says to me, he came for us. He didn't come to conquer us came to know us and to allow us to know him. So that's what we celebrate. Why we celebrate is because God thinks it's worth celebrating. So we intrinsically follow suit and we do it every year. Even pagans celebrate the Christmas season and they do it well. Why? Because it's this intrinsic thing. The son of God came down. We don't know always why we celebrate. We just know it's worth doing this time of year. So let's ask a different question. Do you think Jesus Christ celebrate Christmas? My answer unequivocally is yes. Jesus celebrated all the time. He was hated by the religious elites of his day because Jesus celebrated too much. His first miracle was a miracle in Cana of Galilee where he turned approximately 140 to 180 gallons of water into wine to keep the party going for the wedding ceremony. He was at the houses of tax collectors and sinners and the unlovable for the religious. And he was with them all the time, and they threw dinner parties constantly. And they kind of, well, they didn't kind of, they said, is this Jesus a wine bibber? Does he drink too much? He's always with those sinners having such a good time. I don't think that's okay. So they've been doing it ever since Jesus' day. Jesus celebrated. But what we understand is in saying, yes, Jesus would celebrate, he would also celebrate purposefully. There was purpose in his celebrations. Jesus always revealed something true of God in his celebrations. So here's some things we can look at in saying, yes, Jesus would celebrate. He absolutely would. But in the purposeful nature of it, what would he do to celebrate? How would a celebration with Jesus go? And from scripture, I think you can say this. He wouldn't get caught up in materialism. He wouldn't get caught up in materialism. It just wasn't going to have a hold on him. Remember, Jesus fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fishes. If you own a restaurant, you want that supplier. You could get rich on that meal, right? Did he ever turn a profit? Did Jesus, when he had the opportunity, ever seize or grasp for, for things? No, he didn't get caught up in the materialism. I believe that Jesus would worship Jesus understood the appointed festivals God gave them were moments where they were to celebrate and go into worship and understand the reason their celebration was God's faithfulness and their relationship with him. So Jesus would have been in worship and he wouldn't have been owned by the materialism. He would also serve others. I mean, one of the amazing things to me is the high king of heaven said this, that the son of man came The Son of Man is speaking of himself, Jesus. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Which really ruins prosperity doctrine, right? It ruins the me focus. It says this, that Jesus would serve others at great personal expense, even to the end of his own life. He would be purposeful in it. And what's the message he would teach in the very end? Jesus would tell them the good news, the gospel, that the Son of God had come down not to rule and reign like an authoritarian Caesar or overlord, but to give his life as a ransom for many so that life both here and eternally would be secured in him. He would share the gospel. At every opportunity, Jesus shared the good news. He was the good news, and he told people about his mission and his purpose. Yes, Jesus absolutely would celebrate because his heart was in the right place. So his life became purposeful. So for us, 
it's a heart matter too. For the church in this place, for you individuals, for me in this place, it's a heart matter for us as well. I want to go through a list. Help us out a little bit. Don't you love do's and don'ts? You know, do this, don't do that. Eat this, don't eat that. Those kind of lists. This family, uh, this year, family Christmas parties. Don't compete. Don't compete with your crazy brother or sister-in-law who thinks they have the perfect kids. First of all, they don't. And second of all, neither do you. Because you're people, right? You're people. So don't compete with them. Don't compete. Don't disclude people who are the weird family person that you want to push out. Don't disclude them. Allow them a seat at the table. Allow them a part of the family. Don't worship things. Don't worship what you get. Give thanks for the family you're around. I mean, let's just replay what Courtney said. What are you going to miss the most? That girl is going to cook over an open fire some animals you don't want to know get eaten in the next six months. And she's not like, I'm going to miss a hamburger, which she will, but she won't miss it near as much as the people that are in her life. So, so don't worship things. Don't worship things. Here's some things to do. Serve people. Celebrate with love, joy, and kindness. Be generous and give thanks. Have a heart that kind of overflows. Don't miss your chance to share the gospel. If you're at your work party, this one's much easier, all right? Don't get drunk. We'll just start there. Don't get drunk. Don't be Bob the Lit guy, right? It's not good. That's a pretty easy don't. Don't compete with a guy who's in either the cubicle, the truck, or whatever next to you who has some salary or thing you want. Don't compete. Just celebrate that God put someone in your life that challenges you. Don't be greedy, ungrateful, and mean. Display the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. That'd be a pretty good thing. Share why you love this season. Share what you love about Christmas with people who maybe don't know that you're a Christian in their life. Share with them what you know. Share them the true meaning. Give thanks for your friends, your family, and all the blessings. I could say, amen, you're dismissed. And you could leave this place right now with a couple of lists of morality that change nothing here. Now, I'm not saying you should go get drunk at your Christmas party. Not saying that. But I am saying that instead of doing these things, instead of doing the don't do this and then I am gonna do this, I'm gonna be nice. I'm not gonna get hammered at the party. I'm not gonna do this or that or the other. You'll fulfill a moral list for an indefinite period of time until you're tired of it or the holidays are over and you'll get back to all your old ways and nothing here will have changed. I want to take that list, ball it up, boom, throw it away. We're not here for a morality list. Apparently, according to Isaiah, God hates it when we just do things out of duty. God wants our heart. God wants our heart. He wants to know us. These are good lists. These are things to do. If you were planning on getting tanked at the party, please don't. If you were planning on verbally abusing someone behind their back or to their face at a Christmas party, please don't. Good things to do. But in the end, the question is, where's your heart? Where's your heart? We have to understand that Jesus Christ is after the heart of people. He is not after their behavior because if he changes their heart, inexplicably, their lives will change, right? When your heart changes you begin to live differently. Here's a great story of how this works itself out. In Mark chapter 10, the gospel of Mark, we find Jesus walking with his disciples as he often does. And I want you to picture with me a person dressed really well. So you can do a picture of modern context or whatever. Let's do it in modern context. You know, Jesus walking down, the, walking down Fifth Avenue in New York, okay, with his disciples. And this guy comes running up in an Armani suit, $5,000 suit. Looks pretty sharp. And he says, hey, Jesus, Jesus, um, man, I like you. I want to follow you. I want to follow you. And, and he starts his phrase with, good teacher, good teacher. And Jesus says, why do you call me good? Only God is good. You know, here's what's good. And he says this to him. Do not, um, do, follow what God told you in the commandments. You don't, you don't murder, you don't commit adultery, you don't steal, you don't give false testimony, you don't defraud, and you need to honor your father and mother. The guy in the Armani suit's like, yes, once again I win. I've done all these things, Jesus. I've done all these things. I'm good. I'm good. Jesus told him, don't do all those outside things, right? Don't murder, don't steal, honor your father and mother, outside behaviors. Don't do those. And he's like, got it. 
check and check, sir. Where do I get my disciple robe? Right? He's ready to go. And Jesus turns to him and addresses his heart. He turns to him and addresses his heart. But there's a a unique little phrase here in Mark. I want you to hear it. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a little boy. I've been good since I was little. Jesus looked at him and he said, or Jesus looked at him and he loved him. Have you ever caught that before? Jesus looked at this young man and he loved him. He loved him. And Jesus says, one thing you lack, go take everything you have, all your possessions, sell them, give the money to the poor and follow me. What did all his possessions include on the list of Ten Commandments? Thou shalt have no other gods before me, maybe? How many of us treat money as an idol, right? This man looked down. Remember, Jesus loved him, but he didn't want his behavior. He wanted his heart. And he was willing to let the man walk away if the man wasn't willing to give him his heart. And Jesus said, go sell all that you have, give it to the poor and follow me. And the man walked away with a broken heart because he had many possessions and was a wealthy man. He couldn't give him his heart. He could obey any rule he was given, but his heart was broken. And until he dislodged what owned him, he could not follow Jesus Christ. I need to ask a question. Do you think the rules have changed over 2,000 years, or does Jesus Christ still want the heart of his church? I think he wants our heart. I don't think he wants our penny Annie efforts to be good. If that would have worked, he wouldn't have died on a cross. He wants our heart. So today, we're gonna do what we rarely do in our society. I'm gonna give you a moment of silence. I hate them, unless I'm sleeping. I don't like silence, it upsets me, because I see inside my own soul. If I'm honest, I don't like it. Erica can attest. I'll talk to myself sometimes. We were driving in Chicago last week. She said, you talk to yourself a lot. And I was like, I'm going to talk to you. You be quiet. Like, I, 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 I don't like silence a lot. I'll put a book on it. Ta- I'll do anything. I'll keep my earbuds in. I don't like silence. But today we're going to do silence. A full minute of it. You think, no big deal. I can hold my breath for a minute. No, you won't. You'd be asleep. You just follow. You can't. It's longer than you think, and it's quieter than you know. But we're not doing it just to give you some quiet. I have a question, because for us, it's a heart matter too. So I would like to um, have you ask a question, to ask God to shine his light. And if Christ is, which he is, the light of the world, to have him shine the light of Christ into your heart. And what does he want to transform? Notice I didn't say, what does he want to take away? What's wrong with you? No, no, no. What does a God who loves you, loves you, want to transform into his image? I would like you and I to take a moment of silence. And if you need to look up to re-get the question, just do that. And and I would like you to literally, if you need to do it out loud, you can, but most of us can kind of just quietly speak into our own mind, God, would you shine the light of your spirit into my heart and show me what needs to be transformed. And then we're just gonna sit and we're gonna let him talk for a few minutes. I invite you right now to bow your head and go into a moment of silence with me. Isn't it amazing 
how quickly when you take a moment of silence, you can be like, you know, God, I can see what you need to transform in my wife or my husband, my children. And you can push all these things in so you can see what needs to be fixed. And you take a moment and you just spend it long enough and all of a sudden you're like, there's some things that need to change in me. God doesn't need your good behavior. God's not asking for your good behavior. God's not asking you to play according to his rules. God's asking you to be his, to be his. He wants your heart. He doesn't want the outward actions of your life if your heart's not in it. He wants your heart. And when we speak of transformation, it's one of those things that only the Spirit of God can do, which, thank God, he sent his Spirit to finish the work. We just have to be willing participants. We have to be willing to do the thing the rich young ruler wouldn't, to give up all that holds us and walk towards, towards him who called us, him who called us his own and gave us his name. We have to be willing to do the thing that the rich young ruler couldn't. And in case we don't know, in our culture, most of us are considered vastly wealthy compared to the rest of the world. You may not feel it, but you probably won't go hungry today. You probably won't freeze to death today. And you probably won't die of parasites from bad water. There's a lot of stuff that holds us here. So I want to do something today if your heart is so inclined. I want to invite you to something. I want to invite you to be like Jesus at your celebrations. I want to invite you to be like him. What did Jesus do? He made the most of his time. He took time to listen, to heal, and to care for people who the rest of the world overlooked. I want to invite you to be like Jesus and not shut yourself off to the needs of the world around you, to the voices around you. I, I want to invite you to share the gospel at every opportunity, not just by your mouth, but be a Christian. Be a Christian. Give him your heart and celebrate the way God loves. And don't pretend that our Christmas celebrations honor God in this pagan culture we're living in. Our Christmas celebrations will honor God if we give him what he wants, and it's our hearts. So in being like Jesus and sharing the gospel and blessing others, I often recognize we have in our Reformed context, we, we have Reformed theology, which is like super legit and really good, but then the practice of it's really hard. We don't know how to apply things well to our life, right? You leave church, you're like, that was a pretty good sermon. I'm gonna change nothing, because I don't know how. I'm gonna give you an out today. Something you can do if your heart is so moved. But don't do it just because I'm asking. I don't want you to do it out of guilt. I'm inviting you to something today. So it's a challenge for you. We as the Foundry staff, the, the staff at the church and leadership have really felt the burden of, of what's going on in our community. There are a lot of people hurting in our church and you don't know it. Not because they're, they're hiding it, but because we in this culture don't open up real easily. We like to keep everything between the 40s. Everything's good, right? We have a lot of people hurting. 48% of our town, Zealand, has no religious affiliation. There's a lot of people who don't know Jesus. There's a lot of people who come to church and don't know Jesus. There's a lot of people who don't have family connections and invested relationships. So I'm going to throw an offer out to you. I'm going to read it because otherwise I'll miss details because that wasn't my gift in life to know details. So here's a challenge for you. We're going to have a Christmas party. Now, I know some of you are overwhelmed with places to be this time of year. This is not something that you have to attend. We're not asking you to do more. But if this is something you would like to be part of, please help us celebrate Jesus well. We want to throw a party and keep in mind anyone you might know who doesn't have somewhere to go or just might enjoy being at a fun Christmas party. See, when we're so busy, we forget that in our 30 parties, somebody has none. In our busy life, somebody is desperately, quietly screaming to be noticed. So we've invited some families from the Atlas ministry here, but we are also inviting you to come and with your love, with your heart, help us put this on. So there's the non-trees. Did you notice them? The blonde plywood Christmas trees out here, and they've got tags hanging from them. And if your heart is so moved, there are ways for you to take part. You can help provide hors d'oeuvres, maybe some craft supplies. Maybe you want to help one of the jobs that night, clean up, set up, helping provide a party. I don't know. Whatever your heart desires. But, but celebrate Jesus Christ in a way maybe you haven't before. 
celebrate four other people and find out how much fun you had in the process. Please check out these two trees. And I want to be honest with you. We, Erica and I shared a story on Facebook this week about a time when we were really desperate and really struggling and, um, and it was hard and somebody blessed us and it changed, I think it changed our life. It changed what we were doing in that moment. It brought Christmas home for us. So on those boards are also like gift cards. You can buy Visa gift cards and just return them to the church because we have a lot of families in need. We have a lot of families in real need. And if you're a person who has a little bit more significant means and you can help underwrite some of the help that families need in this community, we would love to partner with you in that. But as your heart desires, not as you feel guilty. To help people not only survive Christmas, but to understand that Jesus came for their heart, their soul, and also to redeem this life and the brokenness in it. We're calling you to help celebrate Jesus in a brand new way. Not in behavior, but in your heart. That your heart would be so transformed that Christmas would come to mean something that mirrors how Jesus would celebrate and less of how we celebrate. So my challenge to you is very simple today. Please, Don't go celebrate Christmas as you ever have before, but go and celebrate that in your life reigns and rules the Spirit of God by the blood of Christ, transforming you into his image. And if you are a Christian and he has your heart, I would invite you to listen closely to what the Spirit's saying because the Spirit's message is always doing one thing. It's revealing him who died for our sins to the world around us. The spirit living through us illuminates to the world the good news of Jesus Christ. And that alone can change this world. In our celebrations, Christ is made famously known. Why? Because God started this practice. We're gonna party anyway. We might as well have a really good time displaying him who we love, not in our behavior, but from right here. Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you. Thank you that we get to be part of a church, a community. Lord, thank you that we're not lonely in this place right now. But Lord, be with those who are struggling in this place today. God, for those of us who everything's okay, we ask, wake us up. Shake our hearts so that we don't sit here cold and stale and confident in our religious practice. Wake us up so that we know that if we're here to stay the same, we're in the wrong place. Wake us up that our lives would begin to illuminate the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ has done for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. He has redeemed the sin, he has redeemed our past and called us into new life. May we live in such hope. May our hearts be changed that the world would see that our lives are not our own. We love you, Lord, and we give you thanks for the opportunity we have to be faithful to you. In Christ's name, amen. Friends, would you please join me and stand and sing. Friends, what matters is the heart, and we can't say we love Jesus here on Sunday and go live lives that celebrate nothing of him. So I think, I love how scripture interprets scripture, right? Revelation says it really well, but I'm gonna use our modern context for it. If you went to a Christmas party, somebody said, hey, we have hot cocoa, and they handed you hot cocoa, and it was 88 degrees, you'd be like, that's like off-temperature chocolate milk, but too thin. It's nasty. You'd be like, thanks. You know, you get rid of it real quick. Even worse, what if you went to the punch bowl, and you were thinking like the punch bowl with the lime sherbet and the Sprite, and so good, and you go up and you get a thing, you drink it, and it's like 98.3? Oh, oh, it's so thick and wrong. You'd hate it, and you'd do the same thing. You'd throw it out. What does Scripture say? Be hot or be cold, but don't be in between. Don't be some horrible version of both. Love God or hate him, but choose one. Give him your heart and live for him, but by all means, don't pretend and put on a religious show. Nobody buys it anyway, right? So what we want to do today is to celebrate, and I am inviting you to celebrate with your whole heart. Him who gave you life with his whole life. Go and celebrate with a new heart and be the faithful people of God. We've given you a way to look. Go look at that tree 
and pray about it. God, am I supposed to do anything? And if he says no, don't feel like Ebenezer Scrooge. Obey him. Obey him and walk away. There may be another need for you to meet. But if he says yes, obey him joyfully. Participate with God where he's at, where he's at work. It's not easy, but the life of the believer is lived first from here, and it gets its way out. As you go about this, living for Jesus from your heart, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it's time for the church to stop at the trees and then leave the building. You are dismissed. <laughs>